The Red Badge of Courage, an Episode of the American Civil War by Stephen Crane, Chapter 4 The creed was halted in the fringe of a grove. The men crouched among the trees and pointed their restless guns out at the fields. They tried to look beyond the smoke. Out of this haze they could see running men. Some shouted information and gestured as they hurried. The men of the new regiment watched and listened eagerly, while their tongues ran on gossip of the battle. They mouthed rumors that had flown like birds out of the unknown. They say Perry has been driven in with a big loss. Yes, Carrot went to the hospital. He said he was sick. That smart lieutenant is commanding G Company. The boys say they won't be under Carrot no more if they all have to desert. They always knew he was, uh, Hannes's battery is took. It ain't either. I saw Hannes's battery off on the left, not more than fifteen minutes ago. Well, the general, he says he's going to take the whole command of the 304th when we go into the action. Then, he says, we'll do such fighting as never another one regiment done. They say we're catching it on the left. They say the enemy drove in our line into a devil of a swamp and took Hannes' battery. No such thing. Hannes' battery was long here about a minute ago. That young Hasbrook, he makes a good officer. He ain't afraid of nothing. I met one of the 148th Maine boys, and he says his brigade fit the whole rebel army for four hours over the turnpike road and killed about 5,000 of them. He said one more such fight as that and the war will be over. Bill ain't scared either. No, sir. He was just mad. That's what he was. When that feller trod on his hand and he up and said that he was willing to give his hand to his country, but he'd be dumbed if he was going to have every dumb bushwhacker in the country walking round on it. So I went to the hospital, disregardless of the fight. Three fingers was crunched. The darn doctor wanted to amputate him. And Bill, he raised a hell of a row, I hear. He's a funny feller. The din in the front swelled to a tremendous chorus. The youth and his fellows were frozen into silence. They could see a flag that tossed in the smoke angrily. Near it were the blurred and agitated forms of troops. There was a turbulent stream of men across the fields. A battery-changing position at a frantic gallop scattered the stragglers right and left. A shell screaming like a storm banshee went over the huddled heads of the reserves. It landed in the grove, and exploding redly flung the brown earth. There was a slow shower of pine needles. Bullets began to whistle among the branches and nip at the trees. Twigs and leaves came sailing down. It was as if a thousand axes, we and invisible, were being wielded. Many of the men were constantly dodging and ducking their heads. The lieutenant of the youth company was shot in the hand. He began to swear so wondrously that a nervous laugh went along the regimental line. The officer's profanity sounded conventional. It relieved the tightened senses of the new men. It was as if he had hit his fingers with a tack hammer at home. He held the wounded member carefully away from his side so that the blood would not drip upon his trousers. The captain of the company, tucking his sword under his arm, produced a handkerchief and began to bind with it the lieutenant's wound, and they disputed as to how the binding should be done. The battle flag in the distance jerked about madly. It seemed to be struggling to free itself from an agony. The billowing smoke was filled with horizontal flashes. Men running swiftly emerged from it. They grew in numbers until it was seen that the whole command was fleeing. The flag suddenly sank down as if dying. Its motion, as it fell, was a gesture of despair. Wild yells came from behind the walls of smoke. A sketch in gray and red dissolved into a mob-like body of men who galloped like wild horses. The veteran regiments on the right and left of the 304th immediately began to jeer. With the passionate song of the bullets and the banshee shrieks and shells were mingled loud catcalls and bits of facetious advice concerning places of safety. But the new regiment was breathless with horror. "'God, Sanders got crushed!' whispered the man at the youth's elbow. They shrank back and crouched as if compelled to await a flood. The youth shot a swift glance along the blue ranks of the regiment. The profiles were motionless, carven, 
and afterward he remembered that the color sergeant was standing with his legs apart, as if he expected to be pushed to the ground. The following throng went whirling around the flank. Here and there were officers carried along on the stream like exasperated chips. They were striking about them with their swords and with their left fist, punching every head they could reach. They cursed like highwaymen. A mounted officer displayed the furious anger of a spoiled child. He raged with his head, his arms, and his legs. Another, the commander of the brigade, was galloping about bawling. His hat was gone and his clothes were array. He resembled a man who had come from bed to go to a fire. The hoofs of his horse often threatened the heads of the running men, but they scampered with singular fortune. In this rush they were apparently all deaf and blind. They heeded not the largest and longest of the oaths that were thrown at them from all directions. Frequently, over this tumult, could be heard the grim jokes of the critical veterans, but the retreating men apparently were not even conscious of the presence of an audience. The battle reflection that shone for an instant in the faces on the mad current made the youth feel that forceful hands from heaven would not have been able to have held him in place if he could have got intelligent control of his legs. There was an appalling imprint on these faces. The struggle in the smoke had pictured an exaggeration of itself on the bleached cheeks and in the eyes wild with one desire. The sight of the stampede exerted a flood-like force that seemed able to drag sticks and stones and men from the ground. They of the reserves had to hold on. They grew pale and firm and red and quaking. The youth achieved one little thought in the midst of this chaos. The composite monster which had caused the other troops to flee had not then appeared. He resolved to get a view of it, and then he thought he might very likely run better than the best of them. End of chapter 4